My name is Jeff Hardison, and I'm with Meridian, and I'm going to go over two case studies. One is with a very large retailer, Macy's, and the other is with Pals Books. They're a smaller retailer. And um, I'm going to apologize in advance if I've got to talk quickly, but I want to try to cover both of these because I want you to see how you can deal with somebody with really big budgets and somebody with really small budgets to create an indoor location experience for their visitors. So real quick, uh, just a brief intro on Meridian so you know who we're, you're dealing with and where we're coming from. We're a mobile app software company. Um, we help venues be able to build apps for their locations. This is like the Venetian, for example. And they can build an app from the ground up, release it to the app stores, have their own icon on it, or they can improve an app that they already have. So this is an example of Macy's. They already had an app. They didn't want to start over. They simply dropped the software development kits into their app, and they were able to get turn-by-turn -turn directions, right? And indoor positioning, that familiar glowing blue dot we all like with outdoor GPS, we get that indoors for iPhone and Android. The other thing we're doing is we're rolling out other features other than just mapping and navigation. So this is a new one we have. It's called Zones. And you can actually draw a little polygon on a map. And when someone walks into that polygon, we can have the Wi-Fi wake up the app with a notification based on where you're standing. So this kind of goes beyond geofencing, where geofencing oftentimes, it can have errors of maybe half a mile away. You could want the geofence for Macy's, but it would happen at Starbucks. Not a good user experience. This allows you to do it right when you're coming in contact with the Wi-Fi, which is basically Wi-Fi fencing, and then also get down to a very hyper-local level. So when you're walking past, say, at the Bellagio, and this is in action today, say you're walking past a cafe, you could wake it up with some type of coupon. Working with a number of different places, um, Macy's, obviously, Subway System New York City, they were just in the Wall Street Journal yesterday for winning an award in their industry for best mobile app, and also Pals Books and American Museum of Natural History, which was the first indoor GPS app for iOS. And then we were bought by Aruba very recently, and I'm um, having a lot of fun with that integration, for those of you that's been through acquisitions. Um, so I'm not going to go through and preach to the choir and really talk about um, you know, where this industry is going and so forth, but I do want to share with you our point of view to know where we're coming from. And what we believe is that the first phase of mobile engagement really didn't take advantage of location, right? So places would have a mobile app, but it was just a mobile-friendly version of their website. And when it did take advantage of location, it was something like a consumer-facing app such as Yelp, where the consumer was engaging with the venue, but the venue didn't have a lot of opportunity to control that experience. So we believe the second wave of location is gonna be about giving some control back to enterprises. So there's a number of retailers and hospitals and hotels in particular that are building apps, branded apps, for their visitors that then engage with them with various utilities. And we believe that privacy doesn't become as much of an issue if you give something back to the actual consumer, right? So they're gonna share their location with you if you give them some type of helpful utility such as mapping, or you give them promotions that are very contextual based on who they are and their preferences. Then they'll be willing to share the location and not have as much of an issue with it. So um, even though a lot of these venues are starting to build apps for their locations, one of the things I wanna share with you today is how hard this is from a political perspective. Right? You know, those of us in the technology industry, we think sometimes we can just make something and if it's good, it's going to take hold. There's lots of people that you have to deal with. So one of the things we were talking about earlier at our table was this notion that even though IT should really be leading these efforts, a lot of times it's marketing. Right? The number one item that marketing has on its plan for this year is create a mobile app or improve their mobile app. Challenge is marketing doesn't always know how this stuff works. They don't know that necessarily apps need Objective-C and Java developers versus in browser experience is very different. And so IT helps them get it done, but it's like oil and water, right? The other thing we gotta take into account are the internal software developers. These are the folks that have been controlling the legacy software system. So in hospitals, that might be patient records databases that have been around for 20 years. In retail, that might be inventory management databases, right? They have to be responsible for then integrating that in the app experience. It's no small task. You also have customer service who's worried about maybe being disremediated and having their jobs changed. You've got the facilities folks. These are the guys that control the, the maps and help control how the building changes. If the maps and the indoor experiences don't adapt quickly with how the store changes, then they're gonna have a problem. Now that's just the company itself. Let's look at everybody else. We've got outside creative agencies. These are the advertising firms who work with, say, Macy's. And they have to be concerned about, you know, is, are you taking work away from me? Is this something I can really weigh in on? I control the brand? You've got custom app developers who do the actual work a lot of times for these agencies, right? There's these small shops in New York and LA. They want to have a piece of this. You've got the legacy software vendors that we talked about. You've got the telecom SPs like AT&T and Verizon are coming in and managing 
the actual Wi-Fi. They're paying for the Wi-Fi for these venues in return for various things, right? Last, you've got the system integrators. These are folks that have been installing Wi-Fi for years, but they don't necessarily know anything about apps. So you have to be able to bring all these folks together and work together in a way that gets something done. So I'm going to talk about Macy's. And if we look at their app, as you can see right here, it was basically a mobile-friendly version of their website, right? So if you were to pull up their Herald Square location in there, it's just a static page. It says mattresses, but you can't tap on mattresses and learn anything about that department. You can't get directions there or anything like that. And what they wanted to do was take advantage of location to be able to change the experience from going what you might use at home when you're planning your trip to when you're actually in the store. Now, they wanted to make sure, because they're very practical people, that they were actually solving business problems. And this is another thing that we all deal with. There's the notion of the early adopter who will do things for a retailer just because it's cool. And there's the more pragmatist buyer who wants to do it because they're going to see real ROI. And what Macy's did was they said, okay, what business goals are we going to achieve? And one of them was is that customer service was busy answering this question, where's the restroom all day, right? Where's the Nike department? And the store is enormous. It's the second largest store in the world in Herald Square. And they knew that if they could be able to free up those staff, those staff can stop answering those mundane questions and start answering more high-value questions, such as, which Nike shoe do you recommend? And so this is how they did it. One thing is they did use geofencing, and that when you go to Herald Square, you'll actually have the experience of the app change based on being on Herald Square. So if you weren't at Herald Square, you wouldn't see this skin. You would see something else, right? And then you can see in there that you have details about the store. You've got mapping and so forth. And what you can do there is that you can actually tap on the map icon, and you see a map come up. Now, those of you that have dealt with mapping, you know that just putting a map in an app is really easy. The hard part is then slicing and dicing that map and just showing the part that's most relevant. So if I'm walking upstairs, I just want to show that part of the map. And then show some type of arrow and text directions that can guide the user almost by the hand to where they want to go. Now, the tackling the issue of the mapping is a software issue. This is something that Objective-C and Java developers can do on their own. The hard part is the indoor positioning. So you can get that indoor GPS experience. That's where you got to bring in those IT people, right? And so what we can do is we can actually leverage the existing Wi-Fi infrastructure of the building to be able to detect where someone is and provide them that glowing blue dot. Do we do it automatically? No. We care about privacy. So we ask them, would you like to share your location for this helpful utility, right? If we want to send them a push notification, we say, would you like to receive push notifications? That's second and third opt-in. And the first opt-in is obviously downloading the app for the retailer. Now, one of the challenges about all this is that there's many different approaches to providing indoor positioning. There's the device-based approach. It works really well for Android because Android allows developers to do all kinds of things. But to do this on both iOS and Android today, you've got to use a network-based approach where you get the data from the Wi-Fi itself. This is really hard. It can get really expensive. It's for the top tier of the market. And the challenge is actually getting good accuracy, getting good latency, meaning the blue dot needs to be where it says it is, and it needs to move with you as you walk, right? So this is kind of a diagram of how it works. The visitor walks in the building, and then I'm going to oversimplify this a bit, but then the Wi-Fi access points and the LAN controller then talk together with the real-time location server. Real-time location servers are something hardly anybody talks about, but there's an amazing invention that came out a few years ago. And all the major Wi-Fi vendors have one. And what it will do is it will triangulate the APs so that you can put the glowing blue dot on the map. Now, you would think that these Wi-Fi vendors knew how to put that glowing blue dot on the map by themselves. They don't. They're hardware guys. They need software people. So software people can do things like create this cloud engine. And what the cloud engine does is it takes that data from the APs and does something cool with it, such as putting the glowing blue dot on the map or sending a push notification to you, depending on where you're standing. So what Macy's had to do was, and this is where it gets a little bit um, interesting, is that they actually had to have the IT person get involved, right? So IT's out of Atlanta. New York and California are marketing. They all come together, and IT installs this real-time location server. They can actually check a box in it, and they can upgrade direct to Meridian, right? It's from the actual Cisco Wi-Fi setup software. Now, the challenge with that is that um, this is something you would learn if you, if you embark on one of these projects. When we first did this at the American Museum of Natural History back in 2010, warts and all, I'm going to tell you, it was very dangerous from an IT perspective because you actually had the consumer walking in, engaging directly with their phone to the real-time location server. If you know any IT people, you know this would give them complete nightmares. So we had to move beyond that and do something a little bit more secure, and that's where we provide that little barrier 
where you have that real-time location server sending the data to the cloud engine, and then they access the cloud engine directly. And it's these kind of things that you have to think through to make everybody, all the stakeholders from marketing and IT, feel more comfortable with these kind of projects. So let's get on to Macy's um, and actually what they ended up implementing. So what they decided to do was they could have obviously been really idealistic. So all of us are very idealistic when it comes to mobile experiences. We want it to be amazing. But you have to take into account that it's challenging for a lot of these retailers to even get these projects off the ground. And what they decided to do, instead of navigate people to products on the shelf, which would have required product database integration, they decided to integrate just with a database of departments, such as shoes or furniture or what have you, and brands. Still no small task. But what they were thought they would do is if they just started with that, they took baby steps, they were practical, they could then prove that out and show the ROI in that, and then move on to the database integration. So what they did was, you can see here, you go to a map, you tap on an icon, a little view controller pops up, and you get turn-by-turn -turn directions to, say, the department or an actual brand. You can tap on the icon and learn about more of the brands that are within that department. Do they carry my favorite perfume, for example? And you could be able to actually search for items such as shoes. Now, this is important. Seems like a small thing, but it took some work for them to be able to say, all right, I want to be able to, I don't know what, I'm, what kind of shoe I'm looking for. I don't even know there's a shoe department, but I want to type in shoes and find where I'm going. And then some people really know what brand they're looking for. So you could type in Samsonite and find out, wait a second, from a product database perspective, Samsonite might be in three different departments in the store. You need to make sure that that reflects in the search process. Now, we do have customers that integrate with actual product databases, right? So Powell's Books is that uh, retailer I'm going to talk to you about in a minute. And what they do is they did the hard work of integrating with the product database so that when you search for an item such as Harry Potter Sorcerers, you can find out, is that product in stock? Is it not in stock? Can I buy it from my phone? Maybe I'm in New York City. Or if I'm actually at the store, can I get turn-by-turn -turn directions there? That is an extra step that requires rolling up your sleeves and doing these integrations because a lot of these retailers create these inventory management databases in-house. They're not using something off the shelf, so that requires a different API integration each time. So what were the results? Um, you know, this was just after two months for Macy's, but what they saw was that there was a 19% increase in new users of the app converted by the new features. They saw more than 44% of the previous app users had downloaded the new version, and they saw 10% of the app users actually went to that one store that had that experience to try it out. Okay, now does this talk about sales increase? Does it talk about customer service? No, because that takes longer in terms of being able to evaluate that. Um, you know, we all like to think people do things because they're gonna see actual return on investment around reaching business goals, but sometimes retailers just want to increase their brand, position themselves as innovators. That was very important to this one. So they were featured in a number of different publications from USA Today to retail publications. And this is the experience as you can see here. Now let's move on to Powell's Books. Um, this is another example where Powell's didn't have the kind of money Macy's had. Powell's is a small independent bookseller. Booksellers are being squeezed tremendously. And what they did was they didn't use Wi-Fi. It does not detect where you're standing indoors, but they still wanted to provide some type of app to their shoppers. Now a little bit about Powell's. They're the largest independent bookseller in the US. They were the first retailer to sell through, uh, through um, Amazon.com, first one ever. And they have a great website. A lot of people love them around the world. It's a whole city block, this store. It's almost claustrophobic in there. When you walk through these shelves, these huge shelves with tons of books, both used and new, that you're completely lost in on many floors. And the way they dealt with it previously was they had these little customer service desks set up with computers. And people would stand behind those customer service desks, and there would be a line to these desks waiting to ask, where is a certain book? What they found, though, was that they wanted to get their employees to not be tethered to that desk. They wanted their employees walking around, finding people that were lost, answering questions. Which Saul Bellow book do you recommend? Which children's book should I buy for my child? So they knew they could automate the process so that those workers then get throughout the store and really engage with the shoppers directly. And what they did was they built a mobile app using our Meridian Editor. And one of the things that was really important to them was they wanted to be able to make it kind of contextual, where if you look at the homepage, these are actually these books on a shelf these are actually ads. One in three people tap on those ads because it looks like it's just a book recommendation. It feels very much like the experience of being in a bookstore. It's not intrusive. They also integrate it with the product management database so that when you type in something, you can see that product, is it in stock, is it not, and then you can get turn-by-turn -turn directions to it. The results they saw was that 
Um, on average, people were spending 30 minutes using the app. And in the first month alone, for one store, they saw a five-figure increase in revenue. This did not use indoor positioning. It did not detect where people are. It's purely just an app where you tell it, I'm starting from a certain position and I'm getting directions to it, and it has a product management database integration. They saw one in three people were tapping on those ads, and that was a whole new revenue stream for them. So they have extra revenue coming in from publishers who want to be in that app. But I think one of the things that really helps kind of make this story come alive is getting the quotes directly from the customer. And you know, they found it was a problem, creating these paper maps they were printing out. Now they just have a sign up that says download our app, people are getting directions to it, and their employees aren't tethered anymore to the desk. One thing that oftentimes is asked is, you know, retailers, there's some cynical people that think that retailers really want to get you lost deliberately. And I really don't think that's so. I think they want you to have a good customer experience. But if you want to be able to route them, you can with these kind of apps. So Pals actually routes people through the widest aisles. They route people past certain types of promotions and so forth. All kinds of things they need to consider. Okay, I'm going to show you um, just a really quick 10 second video of a thing that we're working on right now. Uh, this is a product we rolled out, it's called Zones. And what I think is cool about it is I think it's where, in general, our whole industry is going. And that's taking advantage of location and personalization so we can provide context. It's one thing to be able to wake up an app when you walk past a point of interest inside of a store, but it's another to only wake it up when it's a person wants it to be woken up. If I walk past a Bellagio Cafe, I don't want every single time I walk past to give me some type of notification. So play this really quickly. So this is, um, this is actually the wrong video. Sorry about that. This is, uh, this is an example of the indoor GPS. So you can see that it's, um, it's actually works in both iPhone and Android. Um, I'm standing there next to the fixed restaurant. And you can see how closely I am standing to fix restaurant for that proximity. Um, the other video uh, would actually show me walking past something and then it would alert and wake up the app. So um, in conclusion, a couple things I just want everybody to remember. Lessons I learned, oftentimes painful lessons. Um, consider the politics you're dealing with when you're doing these experiences for retailers and other venues. You've got IT, you've got marketing, and just because you can get marketing to force IT to make a decision doesn't mean IT is going to be happy about it. You've got customer service, you've got facilities, you have all kinds of consultants you have to deal with as well, right? So just really take into account those politics. Two, try to be practical about it. We don't have to change the world today. It's going to be a very iterative process to get to the point where this stuff is really amazing. But if you don't start now, you're never going to learn. And you're never going to learn what works and what doesn't for your organization. And three, I would recommend taking advantage of the technologies that are available today that work versus really trying to go after something that's extremely early adopter, extremely academic right now that might make the job harder on the IT person.